So this particular table compares the difference between thick and thin skin. So we know that thin skin is practically found almost everywhere with the exception of course on the palms of our hands, our fingertips, our soles of our feet, and as well as our toes. Whereas in thick skin, we find it again in the palms, the palmar surface of our digits, in other words, our fingertips and our toes, and as well as the soles of our feet. As far as the thickness of the epidermis or the epidermal thickness, thin skin, the epidermis is thinner, and of course, in thick skin, it's thicker. Now, please note, I am not expecting you to know that the epidermal thickness in thin skin is 0.1 to 0.1. When five millimeters in thickness. That's not necessary. I would just simply like you to know that the fact that thin skin has a thinner epidermis versus thick skin, which has a thicker epidermis. And the thickness of thick skin is because of the fact that they have the stratum lucidum, something that we've mentioned earlier. However, when it comes to thin skin, then that stratum is not there. It's lacking. Now, in addition, to the existence of the stratum lucidum in thick skin, as we saw in the previous slide, the stratum corneum in thick skin is substantially thicker than the stratum corneum in thin skin. So that's another reason why thick skin is given the name thick skin and thin skin is given the name thin skin. Now, as far as the epidermal ridges, they're not fully developed, so we don't really see them as such pronounced structures. And this is because of the fact that they don't have very well organized or well defined dermal papillae. Something that I've illustrated in the bottom of this table, something that we'll look at later. And if we look at the dermal papillae in thick skin, it is more organized, it's well developed, and we can see it nicely. All right, and again, we'll refer to the illustration that I did below this table. Now, what about the existence of hair follicles and the erector pili muscles, structures that we'll look at later on? Well, we know that in thin skin, the fact that it has hair is sometimes referred to as hairy skin. And we also know that there are exceptions to this. So for example, our lips and external genitalia, which are thin skin, do not have hair. Now, if we look at thick skin, they're basically lacking hair. And so sometimes it's referred to as hairless skin. Sebaceous glands, the oil glands, thin skin definitely has them. However, thick skin is lacking or does not have sebaceous glands. Now, what about the pseudoriferous glands, specifically the eccrine sweat glands? Well, in thin skin, they're there, but relative to thick skin, there are way more, significantly more eccrine pseudoriferous glands, which are also referred to as merocrine sweat glands, in thick skin. Now, what about the sensory receptors? What about the sensory receptors? So we have far more sensory receptors in thick skin than compared to thin skin. So what I've done is I've made an illustration, as you can clearly see, below this table. So this right here shows us thin skin, and this shows us thick skin. So take note of the thickness of the epidermis in thin skin and the thickness of the epidermis in thick skin. Now, furthermore, I intentionally drew the dermal papilla or dermal papillae, if we're looking at several of the mounds, as not so well defined or well organized in thin skin. So, you, so as you can see, I did not draw many of the dermal papillae in thin skin when compared to thick skin. Right? So thick skin, I drew more well defined, well organized dermal papillae. Now, if you remember that one of the specialized cells found in the stratum basale, the deepest stratum of the epidermis, we have the tactile epithelial cell, also referred to as tactile cell, also referred to as Merkel cells, and it's intimately associated with the tactile disc, also referred to as the Merkel's disc. So these are associated with light touch and light pressure. So the fact that we have more dermal papillae in thick skin means that we're going to have more of these tactile cell, tactile disc. So therefore, thick skin tends to be more sensitive. Right? So more sensitive to light touch and light pressure. Whereas if we look at thin skin, the fact that they don't have well-defined uh, dermal papillae, then we're not going to have a lot of these tactile cell, tactile discs relative to that of thick skin. So thin skin is not as sensitive as what we have for thick skin. Now note, this is just one example of sensory receptors. So later on, we'll look at the other additional sensory receptors that we find in the integument.
So let's now talk about the two factors that are involved in giving us skin coloration or skin pigmentation. So we have the epidermal pigmentation and we're going to then discuss dermal circulation. So for epidermal pigmentation, we have two pigments. So the first one being keratin, not to be confused with keratin. Keratin is an orange yellow pigment that we find in plants. So for example, your orange colored vegetable carrots or your sweet potatoes, they have a lot of keratin, which gives us the orange yellow pigment found in these vegetables. Well, it turns out that keratin is stored in the cells of the epidermis, or in other words, the epidermal cells. In addition to the epidermal cells, a fatty tissue, in other words, adipose tissue, in the dermis and in the subcutaneous layer can also store keratin. So if you eat a lot of orange vegetables, such as carrots, it's not uncommon then that you start to look more orangey. Okay, it's because again, the cells of the epidermis will store keratin as well as the fatty tissue that we find, for example, in the subcutaneous layer. So this keratin will be converted to vitamin A. Vitamin A, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, is important for immune function, for vision, and other physiological processes that occur in the body, such as cell growth and cell differentiation. Now, the primary pigment as far as coloration of the skin, our eyes, as well as our hair, is melanin. Again, we've already talked about melanin. We know that we have to two different shades or two different hues of melanin, eumelanin and pheomelanin. We also know that melanosomes, which are intracellular vesicles, store the melanin produced by the melanocytes. The melanosomes will then be endocytosed by the keratinocytes or the keratinocytes, which, which will then open the melanosomes and out goes the melanin. Now, the number of melanocytes distributed among the keratinocytes or keratinocytes vary depending upon the region of the body. So for example, the nipples, the scrotum of males and the labia majora of females have a higher concentration of melanocytes compared to other areas of the body. So these are areas of the body that has a darker pigmentation because of the higher concentration of melanocytes. And of course, we also know that melanin protects us from the harmful effects of ultraviolet radiation. And as far as sun exposure, when we expose our keratinocytes or epidermis to the sun, then melanin production begins to occur or the melanocytes begin to produce the melanin. However, it is a slow process, all right? So this is why when you are under the sun, it's not like you get dark within an hour, all right? It's a slow process. You need to give the melanocytes time to package the pigments in the melanosomes and for the keratinocytes to then endocytose those melanosomes. Skin pigmentation depends on melanin production and not the number of melanocytes. So something that we've already mentioned before. So regardless of your race, we all have the same number of melanocytes. The activity will vary and the type of melanin that's produced that gives us the different colorations or the different skin pigmentations that's, that we see across the races. So this particular slide shows us the melanocytes, which are significantly larger than the keratinocytes or keratinocytes, and we know that they're found in stratum basale. And if we look at the difference between someone who has darker skin pigmentation versus someone who has a lighter skin pigmentation, I think it's fairly obvious that you could see the darker eumelanin in the stratum basale, as well as reaching into the stratum spinosum. Now, if we compare this with someone who has a lighter skin pigmentation, uh, we don't have the darker form of melanin, the eumelanin. So let's now talk about a nevus. A nevus is basically a mole, which is a harmless localized overgrowth of melanocytes. So anytime you have a mole, then we tend to have a lot of melanocytes in that area, which again gives us a darker coloration that we see in a real typical mole. Now, rarely does a nevus become malignant. However, it needs to be monitored for any possible changes that occur to the nevus or the mole. So we'll talk about melanoma, later on when we look at various types of skin cancer. Then we also have what are called freckles. So freckles are usually yellowish or brown spots 
And once again, these are localized areas where we have this time increased melanocyte activity. And the degree of pigmentation is based upon how much sun our skin is exposed to as well as heredity. So believe it or not, there's actually a gene that determines how much freckles we have. So I like to call it the freckling gene. So if you have that so-called freckling gene, then the sun exposure that you give to your skin results in more freckles on your skin. However, if you don't have the genetics for a lot of freckles, even if you expose your skin to the sun, you may not have a lot of freckles that form. Albinism is an inherited autosomal recessive condition where the melanocytes are not able to produce the enzyme which is necessary to produce melanin. So as a result, the melanocytes do not produce melanin whatsoever, all right? And so these individuals basically have no hair coloration, so their hair is white, their skin is extremely pale, and as well as the irises, the colored part of their eyes, tend to have a pinkish hue because there is no pigment, there is no melanin. And as you can see with this child over here, this individual has albinism and the hair is white, the skin is extremely pale, and if we were to look into their iris, it would have that pinkish hue or pinkish coloration. Vitiligo is an autoimmune disease. And what is an autoimmune disease? An autoimmune disease or an autoimmune disorder is where the individual's immune cells or their immune system begins to attack their own cells. So in this particular autoimmune disease, their immune system attacks their own melanocytes. Now clearly that should not happen. The melanocytes basically are no longer there. They're, they're destroyed. So therefore, no melanocytes, no coloration, no skin coloration. And as you can see with the fingertips of this individual, their hand, you see these white patches, and that's because there are no longer the melanocytes, no longer producing melanin. And here's another image that shows us vitiligo. Incidentally, there is no cure for vitiligo, and there is no cure for albinism either. So before we move on to the next slide, I just want to quickly mention about albinism. So someone who has albinism or is considered an albino must take extra precaution uh, when they go under the sun because obviously they no longer benefit from the protection of melanin since the melanocytes are not able to produce melanin. So it's critical that they wear adequate protection such as sunscreen. So let's now talk about how dermal circulation affects skin coloration. So we know that in the dermis it's vascular versus the epidermis which is avascular. So capillaries is one example of blood vessels that we'll look at later on. So blood circulating in the dermis will contribute to the color of our skin. So for example, when blood vessels dilate, which is referred to as vasodilation, which means the lumen or the diameter of the lumen increases, therefore blood flow increases. And if more blood is flowing through that area, then naturally the skin becomes more red. If we have excessive redness, then that's referred to as erythema. And this could be due to inflammation, it could be due, due to infection, excessive heat, or an allergic reaction. So this image right over here, you could see we have erythema where we have this excessive redness. Now, if blood vessels constrict, which we know ref is referred to as vasoconstriction, what happens is the diameter of the lumen of the blood vessel decreases. So if the diameter decreases, then less blood flows through that area. And if that occurs, then the skin becomes more pale. That is referred to as pallor. And this could be due to shock, it could be due to excessive cold, or anemia. Someone who has anemia means they have a low number of red blood cells. Now, if we have severe reduction in blood flow that occurs, then the skin turns purple or blue. And we refer to that as cyanosis, which is very apparent in the lips, beneath the fingernails, the fingers, and the toes. And this could be due to extreme exposure to the cold 
or a lack of oxygen to that tissue due to heart failure or severe asthma. So this can be potentially life-threatening. So it turns out that certain diseases or certain illnesses can change our skin color. So one example is jaundice. So in jaundice, what we have is a buildup of bile pigment, specifically bilirubin. Now, bilirubin, which is a bile pigment, is produced by the liver. And if the liver is diseased or if the liver isn't working too well, what ends up happening is we have a buildup of this bile pigment bilirubin. Now, bilirubin has a yellowish color to it. So if there is a buildup of something that has a yellowish color to it, then hopefully it makes sense that their skin starts turning yellow. And it's quite apparent, especially in the whites of their eye. If we look at this image of this individual, you could see how the white of the eye has that yellowish color. Now, the whites of the eyes are referred to as the sclera, something that I'm not expecting you to know. Now, Addington's disease is another autoimmune disease like vitiligo. But in this particular autoimmune disease, the person's own immune system is attacking their adrenal gland. So basically, their adrenal gland is being destroyed by the person's immune cells. So as a result of Addington's disease, one of the things that's seen is the skin becomes darker. They take on a deep bronze tan. It's as if they've been in the tanning salon all day long. Now, we can see this in these two images that I have over here. So what you're looking at, this patch is what their skin color should look like. This is their normal skin coloration, their normal skin tone. But if you look at the surrounding area, it takes on this deep bronze tan. That's classic for Addington's disease. The next thing I'd like to go over are the three types of skin cancer. We have basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. So rather than talking about the three different types of skin cancer in this given slide, we'll talk about it in the next slide. So let's now talk about the three different types of skin cancer. So we have basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. So we're gonna begin with the least dangerous or the least deadly form of skin cancer, and that's basal cell carcinoma. So with basal cell carcinoma, it turns out that this is the most common type of skin cancer. And this is usually associated with ultraviolet light exposure. It's the least dangerous type of skin cancer, and the reason being is because it seldom metastasizes. So what is metastasis? Metastasis is when the cancer cells spread to a different area or region of the body from the initial site of where it formed. So the fact that this type of skin cancer does not metastasize is what makes it the least dangerous or the least deadly type of skin cancer. So it originates in the stratum basale. We usually have this occurring in the face, and it's treated by the surgical removal of the basal cell carcinoma, and that just essentially means the person is now cured. Then we move on to squamous cell carcinoma, and this arises with the keratinocytes or keratinocytes in the stratum spinosum. So this appears in the scalp, the ears, the lower lip, and the dorsum of the hand. And just like basal carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma is also usually due to excessive or ultraviolet light exposure. It's treated by early detection and the surgical removal of this type of cancer. However, if it's not detected early and it is not surgically removed, then there is a chance that it may spread or it may metastasize to other parts of the body. The last and most deadliest type of skin cancer is malignant melanoma. And with malignant melanoma, it is very deadly because of the fact that it's very aggressive in how it grows and how it spreads or how it metastasizes. And malignant melanoma is when the melanocytes become cancerous. So basically, it's cancer of the melanocyte. And it usually occurs with a pre-existing nevus or a pre-existing mole. And individuals are increased risk if they have had severe sunburn, especially as children. 
Now the survival rate is improved by early detection and the surgical removal of the cancerous growth. Advanced cases where the disease has metastasized is quite difficult to cure and is going to require some aggressive therapy, such as chemotherapy, interferon therapy, and radiation therapy. So the usual signs of melanoma follows the ABCDE rule, something that we're going to look at in just a second. But before we do, what I did is I illustrated what a healthy mole should look like, all right, or a healthy nevus. So you could see that the border surrounding the healthy nevus or the healthy most mole is nice and oval, or it could be roundish in shape, and it tends to have one uniform color. It could be light brown, dark brown, it could be black. If we look at the signs of melanoma and an illustration that I did over here, the A stands for asymmetry, which means if we imagine that we cut this mole in half, kind of like what we did when we looked at bilateral symmetry and folded like a book, it is asymmetrical. Now, if we compare that to a healthy mole and do the same thing, it's bilaterally symmetrical. Furthermore, the border is not nice and smooth as what we would see in a healthy mole. Instead, the border or edges are notched, irregular, blurred, or even ragged, as I've shown in my illustration. Furthermore, the color is not uniform. So you're going to have many different colors in malignant melanoma, in this malignant mole. So instead of being this one solid color, instead we see, let's say, speckles of red, speckles of blue, uh, speckles of white. The point is, it's not one uniform color. So that's where the C comes from. The D is the diameter. So it's about the diameter of a pencil, right? So it's a rather large size mole. Again, this is a malignant mole, malignant melanoma. The E is it changes. So a healthy mole does not change, right, throughout life. It shouldn't. Well, with malignant melanoma, it does. So you're going to see a change in size, a shape, or even the color of the mole. So it's essential that if you have these A, B, C, D, E appearances for your mole, you must absolutely have it checked out by a physician or a dermatologist.